Shortly after the end of the Second World War, countries and alliances worldwide began to review their military success and failures. It was the time to invest in advancing military technology itself, not just its quantity. And this led to dozens of futuristic projects brought to life. The hero of today's video is just about that, an amazing brew of political intrigues and truly bold engineering decisions. A project that aimed to blend the best parts of a twin-engine commercial airplane and a large military helicopter, with a mission to transform the lives of millions, both civil and military. Welcome to Big Metal Birds, and today we dive into the turbulent history of the fairy Brotodyne. Inspired by the glory of the Eastern helicopters on the battlefield of the Second World War, namely the Sikorsky R-4 and R-6, Britain was eager to develop its own. Military or not, it didn't matter that much. While the Royal Air Force insisted on developing at least a utility-type copter in late 1951, British European Airways, also known as BEA, proposed another concept. The idea of a bright future and somewhat brave, to say the least, designs wasn't just a thing of the Soviets. Since everyone in Britain's political elite was obsessed with rotorcraft, BEA's idea was to utilize vertical takeoff and landing to create a sort of air taxi, which could operate from the center of one city to another. It could potentially lower the load on public transportation. So, the name of the project came on its own, BA Bus. At that time, everyone was convinced that this could become a regular part of the Britain's public transportation system. The BA bus project attracted an array of proposals from various manufacturers, but one of them stood out from all others. The Ferry Rotodyne, a concept from Ferry Aviation Company that was already known for producing the successful Fulmer fighters and Barracuda dive bombers of the Second World War. Furthermore, Ferry's prior experience with rotorcraft, specifically the FB-1 Gyrodyne, gave the company an edge over its competitors and reassured BEA that Ferry was up to the task. There were a few design concepts Ferry presented to the ministry, and one of them got a green light. The aim was clear and requirements were set. A rotorcraft capable of 40 people plus cargo, with a non-stop flight for at least 300 nautical miles at a decent pace. Interestingly, no one cared about the noise this bird could produce when it lands in the center of the city. That's not your typical Bell or Robinson. That's a 33,000-pound aircraft. Well, we'll get back to this issue a bit later, but let's take a closer look at this bird. In terms of fuselage, it wasn't something completely new, at least to the point of mounting the rotor. The fuselage was designed following the same rules as earlier Douglas planes or Boeing 247. Length and height were very similar to the DC-3, by the way. Rotodyne was 58.7 feet long and 22 feet tall, but had much smaller wings than any other commercial planes of that time, just 46 feet. The closest plane to compare with would be Twin Bonanza, 45 feet. Since one of the requirements for the Rotodyne was to be able to transport large cargo, additional longitudinal beams were installed to reinforce the floor panels. Loading itself was possible thanks to the large clamshell door located at the back of the fuselage. Additionally to the cargo variant, there was a civil modification. It was designed to comfortably accommodate up to 40 passengers, with four seats in a row. A touch of luxury was added by installing spring-loaded stairs just to mention, early DC-3 didn't have that feature and required passengers to use standalone stairs provided by the airport. But let's get to the part that sets this aircraft apart from the others. The massive rotor, spanning 90 feet in diameter and producing enough power to lift 33,000 pounds. An interesting thing about the rotor is that, unlike a helicopter, where the engine spins the shaft, Rotodyne didn't have an engine. Yeah, you heard it right. There is no engine to spin these massive blades. But how could it lift off, you may ask? Well, the secret lies in these little tip jets located at the end of each blade. During the takeoff and landing, two turboprop engines, located on the wings and used for horizontal flight, would serve as compressors to feed air to the rotor tips through a duct system going through the wings, shaft, and rotor blades. Compressed air was then mixed with kerosene and ignited, 
creating enough jet thrust to be able to spin the rotor and perform a vertical takeoff. Since there wasn't an engine that spins the main rotor, there wasn't a need to counterbalance the force with the tail rotor, as in conventional helicopters. When Rotodyne had achieved around 100 knots of speed, the tip jets would be extinguished and two Napier Eland NEL-3 turboprops would provide force for a horizontal flight, while the main rotor auto-rotated and generated just enough lift to keep it in the air. The result of this clever engineering was truly outstanding at that time. In 1959, Rotodyne set a world speed record of 160 knots in the convertiplane category. In general, it performed far better than any helicopter of that time, especially when watching how agile this bird was, despite its size. Two fuel tanks with a combined capacity of 7,500 pounds allowed it to fly for around three hours, covering a range of 400 nautical miles at an optimal cruising speed of 160 knots. Despite being designed to stay at a relatively low altitude, it was still able to climb 13,000 feet. Those numbers might not blow your mind if you compare them to the airplanes of that time, but hey, this bird could land on a conventional helipad. After the prototype demonstration, a few successful flights at shows, and setting a new speed record, the word about the Rotodyne spread around the world. In Britain, BEA placed an order for six civil variants, and the Royal Air Force placed 12 for military variants for cargo transportation. New York Airways wanted to purchase five, and Japan Airlines was interested too, planning to use Rotodyne between the Tokyo airport and the city to decrease the load on their railways. Even the US Army was interested in buying around 200 Rotodynes. But why don't we have this bird flying today? Well, there was one, but very serious issue. Noise. Two things don't go well together, a busy city and a jet engine. Well, Rotodyne was A, jet-powered for takeoff and landing, B, to be used close to business centers and other densely populated parts of the city. Ferre was aware of this issue, and from initial testing in 1951 to first orders in 1955, they've done around 40 different noise suppressors to their tip jets. Their best noise level was 96 decibels from 600 feet away, which is just a bit higher than the stock exhaust of a sports bike. Of course, it's loud, but to me, it doesn't sound like a reason to shut down a multi-million pound project, especially one of this scale and the one that could make Britain famous in the field of civil aviation worldwide. Various articles state that since the project was government-funded, bureaucracy and rapidly shifting priorities of post-war Britain added unnecessary challenges to the Rotodyne project. Even BEA itself had cancelled and restarted the project several times. Of course, the noise issue could be fixed just by making the helipad further away from the city center, but that would completely ruin Rotodyne's main selling point. Unfortunately, in February 1962, UK Aviation Minister Peter Thornycroft announced the Rotodyne project was being discontinued, saying that costs had reached £11 million and the government was not capable of financing further development. Rotodyne undoubtedly laid a foundation for the use of rotorcraft in civil aviation. The speed and range of helicopters don't allow them to be used as public transportation vehicles, but the idea of a commercial VTOL aircraft is actively researched. There are smaller concepts like Joby and Archer that even utilize electric motors, but also there are quite bigger birds, for example, Augusta Westland AW609, a 40-foot-long VTOL, capable of 270 knots with nine passengers on board. The same design was researched by Bell for its V280, but for military operations. Well, as we wrap up the story of this truly one-of-its-kind aircraft, I would love to hear your opinion about this design. And do you think that the VTOL aircraft could become a thing for city-to-city -city transportation? Let me know in the comment section below this video. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Fly safe, and until next time.